We've looked at Chomsky and we've looked at finite state automata. And you've given me a sneak preview about what might be next. And my first thought was, what do all these notation marks mean? And where do they come from? Chomsky instinctively went for a notation that appeals to mathematical logicians or theoretical computer scientists nowadays. Very tight, very compact. What he would basically say about a programming uh, language identifier, which we're trying to define, is that everything in Chomsky's world is a sentence. We've covered this already in the car park. A legal sentence in this language is 55555. Five, 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 five. So everything's an S in Chomsky notation. What he would say about the identifiers problem, in sensible languages, we've got to start off with a letter. I'll call that L. And then the tailpiece to the identifier, well, it could be nothing at all because a single letter is an identifier in pretty well every language, but the tailpiece could be more letters, more digits in any combination, fine. Now, round about the time, late 50s turning into 1960, there was a whole bunch of them defining the language Algol, which was the first language to be designed by a committee and ran into all the usual committee problems. But when you think back to that era, Fortran was there, COBOL was there. They never until later on had a formal definition. The Algol people said, we are going to use something like Chomsky notation to define what's a legal program. John Backus and Peter Nauer, who were on the Algol 60 defining committee, Backus was famous as one of the big inventors of Fortran. Peter Nauer, very famous. European computer scientists, they said, we need something that is more self-explanatory. And they invented a notation that looks like this. Pointy brackets, yes, this early on. And we are going to say an identifier, not a sentence, it's an identifier we're trying to define. And rather than using Chomsky's arrow, which they felt might occur in the middle of a program and cause confusion, they wanted a, is defined as, operation here, which wouldn't ever occur inside a program. But they wanted it to be clear it's part of the definition. And they said, easy, we're not going to call it L, we're going to say letter. And you see the advantage straight away that you can then say, ah, it's a letter followed by a tail piece, which we'll call tail. By putting things in the pointy brackets, we're saying we don't literally mean you must look for the characters L-E-T-T-E-R on your import. No, we mean anything that can be a legal letter. So further down here, there'd be another definition saying a letter is an A, a B, a C, uh, all the way up to Z and all that. The tailpiece is far more complicated because it's any mix of further letters or further digits. But there could be a definition for digits. But the point is they're readable things here. They're readable notions, as they're sometimes called, and they're pretty well self-explanatory, far more appealing um, to setting out a definition of a programming language than you're forever having to remember, oh, letter capital D, is that a digit or is it a, a denominator, you know? Of course, the theoreticians say, oh, it's far too verbose, but yes, I expect, I do understand. You've got to make it clear to people who've got no brain you know, exactly what's going on. So this was very popular for defining languages. So this is a bit like having a how-to guide, is it? It's like saying, okay, this is not programming, this is how the programming works. Yeah, exactly. It's a blueprint for legal programs, all of them. They've got to fit into this template, basically. That's what the formal definition did. And the interesting thing, as many of you are yelling at me now, is this is XML, isn't it? It is the forerunner of XML. XML, as some of you know, started off with a thing called SGML, which was its earlier form, but it was refined into being XML. And right back from the early SGML days, Somebody saw Bacchus Nauer from a notation and said, that is going to be fantastically useful for what we want to do. The characteristic of this stuff is that you never see it in the actual language itself. We can see advantages in actually making these appear in documents. We all know this, don't we? We all accidentally see a listing of our web page that went wrong and you see things like pointy bracket P, pointy bracket. So this is XML, be clear. You see things like BR. And actually, if anyone right clicks on the YouTube web page and says view source, yeah. they're going to see all this they stuff. They see this, they? all that. But what the XML people realised was that so long as you 
introduce the end of slash, just elaborate the notation a bit, you really could use it in an actual document. So the paragraph starts here, the paragraph ends here. The break line here, it starts and it finishes, it's just a marker. And uh, most browsers are tolerant if you miss the, the slash out, but, you know, but theoretically that should be there. So they gave it a new lease of life, really, by saying, well, we're not just going to keep it in the abstract, we're actually going to use it within documents to clearly delineate where things start and where things finish. We were absolutely to the worst case, and we say, well, what is the most complex frame we could reasonably receive? It's this. Okay, can we decode that in less than a frame's worth of time? Yes, we can, you know, and we prove it.